please. The clerk can be sworn, please, sir. Okay. Barbara? No. Swear it. Do you solemnly swear? Raise your right hand, please, sir. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony given in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. Uh, have a seat, please, sir. Mr. Jansen, you wish to be heard. Yes, Your Honor. My client is going to invoke his uh, Fifth Amendment right to self incrimination at this point. Uh -huh. Is the state asking that I compel his testimony? The state is so requesting, Your Honor, here, here under the subpoena for the state of Florida. All right. Mr. Winchester, the state of Florida has asked that I compel your testimony. I do direct that you answer any questions. Any testimony that you give uh, cannot be used against you, or the fruits of what you say cannot be used against you. Uh, it is immunized by the state's request, uh, therefore I would direct that you answer the questions. Anything else, Mr. Yes, Jensen? Your Honor, we request that all questioning by the defense lawyers and by questioning by the potential jurors and by the court would also be under that umbrella of immunity. Okay. Is the state requesting that? Yes, Your Honor. All right. So that be so ordered? Yes. Thank you. Right. And if you've already done this, Judge, I think it's an order date on the 20th of September. We want to preserve it on the record. Okay. My ruling's consistent with the order I previously <laughs> entered. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah. Uh, this may take a while, so why don't we go ahead and take a quick five minutes uh, break so that you probably won't get the jury back in here that quick. But, uh, you're right. <clears throat> Anybody be seated, please? Call your next witness. Your Honor, this time today was called Brian Winchester. And Mr. Winchester has been sworn outside your presence, so you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I need you to speak up a little bit. Good afternoon. That microphone is not doing much, so we'll just need to speak up a little out for us, please. All right. Can you please introduce yourself to the jurors. Brian Winchester. And Mr. Winchester, uh, how old are you? 48. Mr. Winchester, do you know or did you know Mike Williams? Yes, sir. Um, prior to 2000, how did you know Mike Williams? Mike and I went to high school together and got to know each other very well. We were very good friends. Um, we continue to be friends all through college and all through uh, are marrying, getting married, and uh, we were we were very good friends. He prior was a very good friend. Prior to two thousand, were you married? Yes, sir. And who were you married to? Kathy. And how long had you known Kathy prior to two thousand? From high school. Would you, Mike, and her all go to high school and college together? Uh, the four of us all went to high school together. Yes, sir. Who's the fourth? <clears throat> Denise. And what was Denise's relationship to Mike? Denise and Mike were high school sweethearts. My wife, Kathy, and I were high school sweethearts. We all uh, dated in high school and, and off and on through college, um, and then ended up all getting married. And it's my understanding both that you and Kathy had a child? Yes, sir. Little boy? Yes, sir. And that Mike and Denise had a little girl. Yes, sir. Were they roughly the same age? Yes, sir. At some point, did you and Denise become an item, I guess, if you will, um, prior to 2000? Yes, sir. When was that? When did it start? Yes, sir. It's, I mean, the date that we used was uh, October 13th, 1997. Um, but there was a lot that led up to that point, a lot of background. Let's talk about what led up to that point. Um, as I said, she married her high school sweetheart. I married my high school sweetheart. And at first, things were really good, I think, with all of us. Um, but... Um, I was not a great husband, and 
uh, spent a lot of time away uh, doing hobbies and just stupid stuff. And uh, at one point, I, I found a note <clears throat> in my first wife, Kathy's purse. Uh, and basically, I came to realize that she had been cheating on me or, or was cheating on me uh, with another friend from high school uh, named Gavin. And it crushed me. And after that happened, I began to look outside of my marriage. Um, you know, I guess I had a lot of motivations, but it led me to uh, eventually um, end up with Denise. We all started going out a lot. Um, Let me stop you right there. We all being who? Um, my wife and I, Kathy and Denise and Mike, we started going out to bars and concerts and drinking and doing a lot of things that we didn't really do while we were all in college when probably it's more appropriate to do those sorts of things. But we started going out, uh, a lot of drinking, and um, I remember one night in particular, there were several nights that we did this, but one night in particular we um, we started talking about sex a lot, um, the four of us. And I... Um, <clears throat> You know, I was friends with Denise in middle school and high school, but I was never attracted to her uh, until that point. And um, so after we started talking about sexual things and things that married couples shouldn't be talking about with each other, um, I think that's when the spark kind of started between the two of us. Let's go to October 13th, 1997. You said that's the date that you used as an anniversary or something? Yes, sir. Um, we were going out, like I said, going out a lot. And one night in particular, we uh, we were going to Floyd's. And, um, and so Denise and I, uh, we pulled up on Tennessee Street. And uh, Denise and I jumped out of the car. Uh, and left Mike and Kathy to go park the car and uh, went down to the entrance of Floyd's and that was the first place that we like kissed each other and made out and um, we had our night out and then after we all went home uh, to our separate houses. Well, let me stop you right there. You and Denise made out that night but Mike and Kathy were present? They were in the car. They were parking the car. It was while they were gone parking the car. Um, and Who so, was there that night? just the four of us. Um, was Lindsay Lockhart there? Not that night. Okay. Uh, the Stafford? Not that night. Not that night was just the four of us. Okay. Um, and so later that night, after Kathy and I went home and Mike and Denise went home, um, she and I got on the phone together, and we basically spent the whole night talking to each other on the phone, and it was just like. I don't know, we just, we connected like nobody else. I mean, we just really connected and we had a lot of sexual talk and had phone sex and that sort of thing. And um, we agreed and then uh, met up the next day. Uh, I think we just met during her lunch break at work. Um, and that's kind of what just started the whole ball rolling with her and I. Was this a one-time occurrence or is it? Ongoing. Was what what a one time? You and her having sexual relations. Oh no, um, that's that's just what started it. I mean, then it you know it snowballed really fast. We started meeting in hotels. We started meeting during the work day. Um, we started meeting whenever we had the opportunity. If Mike was at work, Mike worked a lot. He he really was a workaholic, quite frankly. Um, she was not happy uh, with with that, um, and uh, so we started meeting uh, very regularly and having sex very regularly. Um, eventually, we started uh, going on trips together. There was times when she and Mike would go on trips, and I would go and, and meet with her, like if he had a conference in Panama City. Um, I went over, and while he was in the conference, Denise and I uh, went to Destin together, um, and uh, 
we took trips to New York, uh, South Beach. Um, we we spent a lot of time together. Um, Orlando, I remember going to Orlando with Kathy. Um, I don't remember, I don't remember if Denise and I went to Orlando, just the two of us or not. Probably we, we went lots of places, Panama city. Um, during that time period, you mentioned you'd go to hotels. Yes, sir. You meet up during the day. Yes, sir. Um, were you ever at your house? Yes, sir. What about her house? We would primarily go to her house, um, and it was primarily during the work day. We would meet at Home Depot parking lot or meet behind Kaiser College, leave a vehicle and go to her house or go to my house, sometimes not go to either one of our houses, depending on uh, how long she could be away from work. Um, but um, Where was her house located at? Her house was off Meridian on Star Mount, 256 Star Mount, I believe. Um, Did you ever park at a um, Grace Lutheran Church at one of the locations of Dr. Toro? There was a church in the woods off of Meridian, and I would park at that church, and there was a drainage ditch that ran from the church through the woods into her neighborhood, and I would walk down the drainage ditch, and then there was only a short uh, distance that I would have to walk from the drainage ditch down Star Mount to get to her house to kind of be undercover, I guess. But there was a church on Meridian, when, I'm sorry, on Miccosukee. Um, I don't know why we parked at churches a lot, but I guess empty parking lots. But there was a church off of Miccosukee Road that uh, I would leave my car at occasionally after they moved to uh, Miccosukee Road to Midyet as well. Okay, when was that? Well, I mean, it wasn't. When, moved to Road. when did they move there? Um, I don't remember exactly. I would say about a year and a half prior to Mike's death, if I had to guess. Okay. And we asked questions um, earlier about Lindsay Lockhart. Who is that? Um, Lindsay Ketchum. It's, yes. Yes, sir. Formerly Miss Ketchum. Right. Um, she was primarily a friend of Mike's. That uh, Mike worked for the Ketchums, and uh, Lindsay's the Ketchum's daughter. What about Angela Stafford? Angela worked with the Ketchums as well and was good friends with Mike and, and us, but primarily with Mike because she worked with Mike. At some point, did you and Miss Stafford also have some sort of relations? Um, we, when you say relationship, um, yes, sir. Um, I believe it was my birthday. It was either my birthday or Angela's birthday uh, on one occasion. And we wanted to go out, um, the three of us, Denise and I and Angela, um, wanted to go out. And for some reason, Denise couldn't go out. I don't know if she couldn't get a babysitter or what happened, but she said, no, no, you go on. And I was like, no, you don't want me to go out with her without you. And she's like, no, it'll be fine. And so Angela and I went out and had a lot to drink and ended up back at my house in Killarne Lakes um, and ended up in bed together and it was dark and all of a sudden the light came on in my bedroom um, and I looked up and Denise was standing there and she said something like she said something sarcastic and, and said I'm sorry or something and ran out and I didn't want Angela to know it was Denise I think she did know but I didn't want her to know and so I lied to Angela and told her that uh, that I thought it was my wife my ex-wife at that point Kathy um, uh, but um, so this is after Mike's death yes sir but is it before you and Denise had announced that y'all were dating each other correct we were hiding it at that point Talk about life insurance policies. What is it that you did back uh, for a living back in 2000? Um, part of my job was to sell life insurance. Okay. Did you um, sell life insurance policies to Mike Williams? 
Yes, sir. Um, I sold him two different policies. I sold him one policy um, early on. Um, say early on, when are we talking? He may have even, I don't know, we wouldn't have been in college. It would have been right after we graduated from college, so. Uh, Which is when? 93, 94, somewhere in there. Um, pretty early on, because I think at first, uh, he had uh, his mother as a beneficiary, and that was a $250,000 policy. Um, and that was before he was married to Denise. Um, eventually, after they got married, he changed the beneficiary on that policy to Denise. And then, uh, you want me to talk about all that I know about his policies, whether I sold them or not? Or? Let's talk about the million-dollar policy. Okay. Um, so that was the first policy that I sold him, and then uh, after, was it after Ansley was born? I believe it was after Ansley was born. Yeah, it was after Ansley was born. Um, he uh, he and I talked about increasing his coverage. Um, and whose idea was that? To increase it. Mm -hmm. <sighs> or was it a mutual idea? I mean, it was it was. A combination of Denise and I uh, talking about him having more coverage and uh, he and I talking about having him having more coverage. Um, I mean, there was a lot of conversations behind the scenes as to getting that new uh, policy. In all honesty, having a larger policy of a million dollars on a man who's married, kids, and making income is, isn't necessary, necessarily abnormal. It's not, a, it wasn't extravagant based on the income that he was making. Uh, but nonetheless, there was conversations and he elected to have a million dollar policy. So. Right. He wasn't real, I think to him it was a lot of money. Um, I think he even had conversations with uh, Mr. Ketchum about it. Um, but um, he, you know, he eventually. Uh, Decided, and I think with Denise's encouragement, decided to uh, to go ahead and get that extra million dollar policy. And when was that? When did he get the policy? Yes. Sir. I get a little confused because he had one policy that was issued that actually we 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 didn't get the premium paid or something, and so. Uh, he actually had a, a second policy, same thing, same company, same everything. I think there was only like a three-month gap in between that. But um, it was within, uh, it was within, I, I think, six months to a year before his death occurred. He mentioned another policy. Let's go sidebar for just a second. We don't need the court report. Sorry, I didn't write that on. No, I don't see any, but I thought maybe that would solve the issue. Go ahead, Mr. Hey, Um At some point, were you aware of him having another policy in the neighborhood of half a million dollars? Yes, sir. Um, he had another policy with a different company uh, that he bought from a different person. Um, I don't remember when I first became aware of it, but um, I know I became aware of it when I would have been talking with him about the million-dollar policy. Um, and his thoughts or intentions were that he was going to drop that $500,000 policy and replace it with the million-dollar policy. Well, let's fast forward to the year 2000. At some point, were there thoughts of how you and Denise could be together? Yes, sir. Um, How did that get initiated? I think I think it even started prior to that. As as I've thought about this and had plenty of time alone to think about it, um, one thing that I have remembered is um, the prior year. Uh, Mike and I were on a um, hunting trip together, and it was at a, a lake that was dry. And 
we had to walk across the mud and there were places in the mud where I, I don't know how to describe it, but basically you could fall through the mud and there was nothing underneath. It was like, it was basically, I guess people would call it like quicksand. Um, and, um, uh, Mike fell into one of those mud holes at one time. Um, and it was just he and I out there and I helped him out of it and he, he had dropped his gun in there as well and he ended up going back in it after his gun um but um anyways i remember telling denise about that and how if i hadn't have been there or if i hadn't have helped him out that um you know it's very likely he would have disappeared and nobody would have known what happened to him but um that's just something that i had remembered uh in the past few months and thinking about this but um, I think it was gradual that we, you know, the more we were together, the more we wanted to be together. Um, and the more we griped about Kathy and Mike, the more we wanted to be together. Um, it just kind of, it, it just got worse and worse. I mean, we just, it just snowballed. We just, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, but. So yes, we, we eventually started talking about uh, options and ways that we could be together. Um, and Denise, because of the way she was raised, because of her pride, I, I guess I, I can't say all the reasons, but she did not want to get divorced um, and stated that she would not get divorced, but she still had a desire for us to be together, um, which narrowed the options uh, even further, I guess. Who narrowed those options? I'm sorry? Who narrowed those options? Um, it, it was all of our conversations and planning and everything, I, I, I would say is very mutual. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that, that uh, Denise planned everything and, and, you know, I was just a dumb guy who went along with what she wanted to do. I mean, I, I instigated a lot of it. I, I helped come up with ideas. I planned a lot of things. Um, but overall it was very mutual. I mean, we wanted to be together and we weren't going to let anything stop that. Um, so over the year and a half year, Prior to Mike's death, we discussed several options and alternatives of, of uh, ways that we could be together. What was one option? One of the options, uh, Mike, Mike worked a lot at night uh, up at his office. And one of the options was um, that we could make it look as if uh, there was a, a burglary of some sort up at his office and that he uh, got shot in some type of robbery or something up at his office. Um, Denise didn't like that idea. I didn't like that idea and Denise didn't like that idea, but primarily because there would be an investigation uh, if something like that occurred. So another idea uh, we all used to go out on boats a lot, and Mike had a boat. And another option was that uh, the four of us would go out on a boat out into the Gulf. The four of you being who? Um, me and Kathy and Denise and Mike. And uh, we'd go out in a boat on the Gulf. And basically uh, that Kathy and Mike would be pushed overboard and that Denise and I would find a buoy way offshore that we could uh, hold on to and either let the boat sink or let the boat take off on its own or whatever and make it look like we had an accident on the water uh, and that Denise and I had survived the accident. Obviously that didn't happen. Correct. At some point... Did the discussion turn to strictly Mike being the one that dies? Um, I had no desire whatsoever for anything to happen to Kathy. I didn't really emphasize that with Denise um, 
because it was not good for me to express affection or, you know, care about what happened to Kathy uh, with Denise. Um, but silently to myself, I was never going to allow anything to happen to uh, my son's mom. Um, so another scenario that we came up with was Mike and I going on a hunting trip together uh, and there being an accident where both he and I uh, ended up in the water and uh, he drowned and, and I did not. Denise liked this idea um, because it, I don't know how to word it exactly, but she felt better, I guess, about herself or we could feel better about ourselves if there was a, a chance that he could make it out of it. You know, I mean, I, I think there was even talk about, you know, well, it'll be up to God uh, what happens and not us. It won't be a murder. It'll be, you know, an accident. Um, it's kind of screwed up thinking, but um, that was a scenario that she uh, could live with, I guess. Would it be fair to say that having the attention of being a widow was far better in her mind than being a divorcee? Yes, sir. Um, better to be a rich widow than a uh, a poor divorcee and her her biggest concern with the divorce was she didn't want to share custody of Ansley with with Mike um, she was not going to have Ansley going back and forth to two different uh, houses um, she wasn't going to give that up the drowning scenario did you take any further steps to make that happen <sighs> Like, uh, what do you mean take any steps to make that happen? Like what happened? Try and do that. Yes, sir. Um, so there was a limited time that we could make that scenario occur because it had to be during the duck season. There's only certain days that you can actually go hunting on duck in duck season. Um, and it had to be... Uh, at a place where, in my opinion, it would have been successful, which kind of ruled out all of the local lakes around Tallahassee because the lakes around Tallahassee are mostly shallow. Um, Lake Seminole uh, is a lot deeper. Um, <clears throat> let me ask let me have another question. You talked about the life insurance policies and the $500 lapsing. Did that also factor into your equation? Yes, sir. Um, there were a lot of things that were kind of pressuring us for this to happen um, when it did. Um, one was Mike had intended for that policy, the $500,000 policy, to, to lapse. He, he was not intending to continue it. And so um, behind his back, uh, Denise paid one more. I can't remember if it was quarterly or semi-annual premium, but we kept it going. Uh, one more premium period and we knew we weren't going to be able to keep it going perpetually that he would eventually see this money hey it's going out of the checking account for that policy that I didn't want anymore so there was that um, he was becoming a couple of things he was getting angrier and angrier about the fact that she wasn't having sex with him um, he and I took a trip in November out to Arkansas together, so we spent 20 hours in the car together, and um, I heard a lot uh, about how unhappy he was, you know, with Denise, and uh, he was not happy with not having not having sex. Of course, I was, I didn't want him having sex with her. Uh, she didn't want to have sex with him, but. Um, so he even talked about moving away. He talked about moving out west. He talked about all kind of, you know, things. But um, he was becoming very uh, unhappy, and he was also becoming suspicious. Um, he raised uh, his suspicions with me, not about me, but about Denise uh, on that trip to Arkansas, um, that he thought something was going on with her. He, 
He thought she was using drugs. He thought uh, he had seen money disappearing. She'd been taking cash withdrawals out of the ATM, which I knew was for travel for us when we would go out of town. Um, but he, he kind of thought it might be for drugs or something. Um, uh, I think he even approached Denise's uh, mom about it at some point, uh, asking her about it. But um, so also their anniversary was coming up uh, in December. And uh, the 16th or the 17th, I believe, 16th, I, I believe it was. Um, and uh, he planned uh, for them to go uh, to Apalachicola and stay at the uh, Gibson Inn over there. And I think made it pretty clear that he was ready, you know, Denise didn't have sex with him while they, while she was pregnant and after Ansley was born, um, you know, to my knowledge at all, um, unless she lied to me about it, which she could have, but, you know, based on what Mike said, he kind of confirmed that. And we checked up on each other a lot. Denise would check up to see if I was having sex with Kathy and I would check up on her to see if she was having sex with Mike because we, you know, we considered ourselves a couple together. Um, and uh, anyway, so I think Mike made it pretty clear that this anniversary trip, it was going to be expected that this was, you know, going to be their starting over date, that it had been long enough since Emily had been born that it was time for them to start having sex again. Um, I think he was kind of putting some pressure on Denise about that, and she did not want to go on that trip, did not want that trip to happen. So was the plan made? Steps yes, sir. So, you know, we decided that 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 was the plan that we were going to go with. Um, well, let me ask you a question. You earlier talked about time of the essence because of duck season. Why is it important for the duck season aspect of this? Um, well, because that was the plan was he and I to be on a duck hunting trip together and to go to Lake Seminole. Um, so duck season only lasted uh, from Thanksgiving until the end of January. I may have even been shorter back in those days, but there was a short time frame that, that the season was in. And then within that season, uh, you know, we couldn't necessarily go every single day. You, you had to, uh, in some places, you can only hunt on Wednesdays and on the weekends, Saturday, Sunday. Um, but um, so we knew our window of opportunity was was closing basically um, so it was decided that that was the plan we were going to go with and um, we there were several things involved um, Denise really didn't have to do a whole lot other than come up with an alibi for herself um, and make sure that Mike went <clears throat> um, I had to had to do you know more obviously, um, but um, it was decided that uh, Mike and I would go on this trip. Um, I had to, you know, I wanted to make sure he was going to show up. So, uh, you know, there was a week prior that that this was planned, and then it, that it didn't occur uh, before the actual time that it did occur. Well, let's talk about that. The week prior it was supposed to occur. Yes, yeah. sir. So uh, a week prior, we had it set up that this was going to be the date that, that uh, the trip was going to occur. So Mike and I planned uh, to go, you know, on the trip. And then late the night before, I believe it was before midnight, um, I, and I believe Mike was at his office, and he called me and he said, um, uh, I can't go. Denise has called me. She doesn't want me to go uh, on the trip. And I was very surprised, uh, shocked, kind of. And uh, I was like, okay. Um, and because we had, you know, made all this plans for this to happen. And so I can't remember what I called Denise. I, I think I called her immediately after I hung up with with Mike, uh, just to see, you know, what, what, what is going on? I mean, because this isn't something you need to be wishy-washy about. 
Um, and I can't, I can't remember if I talked to her that night or if it was the next day, but we talked very shortly afterward. Um, and basically, it was just a, a cold feet kind of thing. Um, and, and she, you know, got cold feet at the last minute. Um, so that we... Plan, the plan's off? Well, it, didn't it wasn't that the plan was off, but we, we talked about it and we, we had several, you know, more conversations that, you know, look, this is either we're going to go forward with this or we're not. I mean, we're either going to be together or we're not. Um, you know, like I said, the... The policy is ending. You got that anniversary trip coming up next weekend. Um, you know, duck season is going to be ending soon. Do you want this to happen or not? Uh, you know, I don't want to set these plans up if this isn't something, you know, this isn't something you need to be wishy-washy about, I guess, basically. So at some point uh, during the next week, it, it was decided again that, uh, yes, this is what we were going to do. Um, you're talking about you're telling her can't be wishy-washy. Times are ending. I mean, if we have a certain time frame, we have to do this. And then it almost sounds like you were pressuring her to that. Would that pressuring her? Um, I don't think it was pressuring her as much as stating the facts of this is this is the reality of the situation. If you want this to happen. This is the best time for it to happen. Um, Were all of those issues things? I was not happy. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I was not happy about the fact that we had made these plans and I had committed that this was what was going to happen. And then at the last second, she backed out. I, I didn't understand that and uh, wasn't real happy about that. But um, Were all those issues that you just talked about things that you previously discussed with her? Yes. The time frames and everything like that. Right. So you call her up and you tell her all these things, this not be wishy washy. Were there other communications where she was talking to you about putting the plans back in place? Right. Yeah, well we we met up eventually and probably met up several times that week. At that point we were meeting, you know, a lot. Um and so we met I'm sorry. When you talking about met up, you're like going out to eat, or what are you talking about? No, the same as we always did, meeting during the work day, uh, primarily during lunches, uh, that sort of thing. So we. Uh, you know, sexual relations. Well, we didn't always had I had sex every time, but during that week, a primary reason we were meeting was to discuss what are we going to do here, okay. um, you know, what what's going to happen here. Um, so we we met up during that week and, and talked about it in. Uh, came to the conclusion again. And I remember where it was. It was at Roden Cove, at the uh, boat ramp at Roden Cove. Um, where is that? Um, on Lake Jackson, off of Meridian Road, um, at the end of Roden Cove Road. Um, but we decided that, that this is what we were going to do. We're not going to back out of the last minute. And, and in a sick sort of way, you know, it was kind of like, you know, well, if God wants this to happen, this is what's going to happen, because the plan, again, was that it was going to be an accident, and, you know, there would be a chance that he could get out of it. You say you met up. Why meet up rather than phone calls or something like that? Any particular reason? Um, well, it's not necessarily something you really want to talk about on the phone. We weren't really that concerned or paranoid about that sort of thing at that point. Um, but we just met up routinely because we wanted to meet each other because we wanted to see each other and be together. All right, so then at that time you meet up at the Cove and make a decision. Yes, sir. So what's supposed to happen? So it's the same plan. It's it's same night, just a week later. Um, and... Uh, from what I remember about that uh, night before, um, Mike Mike had volunteered to ring the bell for the Salvation Army at like a Walmart, and uh, K 
Kathy and I uh, had planned on going out to a concert <clears throat> uh, at Floyd's, and I wanted us all to go out, as I remember it, um, but that didn't end up happening for whatever reason. I don't know if they couldn't get a babysitter um, or wh why they didn't end up going out with us, but Kathy and I did end up going out to that concert. Part of the plan was that um, I wanted Kathy to to basically be as drunk as possible the night before because I wanted her to sleep late in late the, uh, the next morning. Um, my my alib my alibi. The plan was that uh, all of this would occur very early in the morning, and I would have time enough to get back and meet my father-in-law uh, up near I-10 and Thomasville Road to to actually go on a hunting trip with him. So that was going to be my cover, going to be my alibi. Her alibi was going to be that she was at home with Ansley, and uh, the plan was when Mike didn't uh, come back home that eventually she was going to start calling her sisters and her dad uh, from her house phone so that she could establish that she was at the house, prove that she was at the house um, uh, with Ansley. Okay. So what was the plan to make this happen? What happened? So Kathy and I went out um, and uh, went to the concert got home late. She did have a lot to drink. Um, there was discussion between me and Denise, and I can't remember if I actually did this or not, or if I did it the week prior, or I, I just really can't remember, but I remember Denise and I talking about um, there was some medication. There was some medication that Kathy had. And uh, we talked about uh, giving her a little bit of that medication that would cause her to sleep really heavy um, and make sure that she slept really good uh, through all of it because uh, I didn't want her to wake up and realize how early, I didn't want her to know how early I was uh, leaving the next morning. Um, so the plan with Mike was that I would meet him at a gas station on Thomasville Road up near the overpass. Well, the overpass I don't think was there at that point, but meet him up at a gas station up near the McDonald's up there. <clears throat> and uh, I met him there. I had told him that uh, we were going to go to a secret special spot to go hunting. And, um, and that he needed to bring his waders. I had to make sure that he brought his waders because the belief was there was kind of like a, there still is probably like a duck hunter's myth that if you fall overboard with your waders, you're going to sink really quick and drown. So I had to make sure that he brought his waders. And um, so I told him about this, you know, great spot that we were going to go and he needed to bring his waders. So I met him at the gas station and I told him, when he drove up, I was real paranoid about phones and him calling me and there being a record of him calling me. So I told him that my battery was dead on my phone, that there was no reason for him to call me um, as we were driving over to the lake. Because normally we would have called and talked to each other uh, on the phone or even ridden together. I, I don't even remember how or why I, I told him that I needed to use my vehicle instead of just going in his. But for somehow I... I came up with some reason to do that. Um, right there real quick. You said that you called him and tried to get him to make sure he was going to get the waiters. Um, when did you call him to talk about that? I don't remember specifically. We, we talked several times. You know, Mike and I talked every day um, ourselves. Um, and uh, so, you know, we talked about hunting all the time. Uh, and we talked about this trip several times prior to it happening. Um, so I uh, followed him over to the lake. He had his boat behind his Bronco, and I followed him in my white Suburban what lake? Uh, lake Seminole, which is about 50 minutes away. And um, 
I, uh, I told them what landing we needed to go to. And so we pulled into the landing and uh, launched the boat. And uh, I, I said something. I had to make sure that he had the waders on. So I said something about we're running low on time or, or you know, we're going to be really pushed. And Why was it, it so important for the waders to be on? Because I believed and we believed that that if you fell overboard with the waders on that you would sink pretty quickly. So um, I told him something like we're, you know, we're running late, you know, we need to go ahead and put our waders on, you know, here and now uh, before we get in and, and go. And so we both did that. And because I knew where we were going hunting, um, I was in the back of the boat driving and he was uh, in the front. Um, so what kind of boat are we talking about? We're talking about a large airboat or what are we talking about? It was a, a what's called a genoo. It's basically a canoe that has a flat uh, flat back that you can put a motor, a small motor on the back of it. I'm familiar with canoes. Canoes can be a little tipsy. This boat, the same way. this boat was, yes, basically like a canoe, so pretty, pretty tippy. Okay. So you had you put the boat in the water and you're heading out and you're driving? Yes, sir. I was driving, and I know I was very concerned about the time. Um, everything had taken longer than what I had anticipated, and I had to be back in town early enough in time to meet my father-in-law for, for my alibi trip to occur. And so we, we headed out, and there was a deep area, maybe a couple hundred yards from the landing that we put in at. And um, we got to that area that I knew was a, a deep area. And I, I don't remember exactly how I got him to stand up, but... I don't know if I pretended something was wrong with the motor or the weight in the boat was off or something, but I, I basically stopped the boat and got him to, to stand up, and when he did, I pushed him into the water. What happened next? <sighs> so he was in the water. And he was, like, struggling. And the motor of the boat was still running. And I pulled off just a little bit to get kind of away from him so that he couldn't reach back into the boat. And I didn't know it at the time. I, I didn't know if he was trying to swim or I didn't know what was going on, but... but what I came to find out or eventually realized was he was taking the waders and the jacket off. And he, uh, he got those off and I, I think I forgot to tell you about this part before, but, um, but I remember now that that area of the lake had a lot of um, snags, a lot of dead trees that come up out of the water and there's a lot of stumps that come up out of the water. And he swam over to one of those stumps and held on to it. And he was panicking, and I was panicking. And none of this was, like, going well. I thought it was going to go. And I didn't, I didn't know what to do. But, um... He was, he started to yell. And I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know how to get out of that situation. <laughs> and so, I had my gun in the boat. <laughs> and, uh, so I loaded my gun, and I just 
I made one or two circles around and I ended up circling closer towards him and he was in the water and as I passed by I shot him Head. Um. So when I shot him, it was dark and there was a bright flash when that happened. And I didn't want to see what happened. So like I closed my eyes when the instant of that flash happened. And the boat was moving as this happened. And so I turned back around and came back to where he was. And got to the stump. And I knew I couldn't, I couldn't leave him there being shot. So I was going to have to do something to cover this up. And I reached down and he wasn't far under the water, but like my whole arm got wet. And I remember wondering like, how am I going to explain that my arm is soaking wet? And I was afraid I was going to have to jump into the water. But I reached down and I grabbed a hold of him and I was closer because of where I had driven the boat. I was closer to another landing, just a little dirt landing that was further down the shoreline. And so I decided to motor the boat and pull him over to that landing over there. So I drug him in the water over to that dirt ramp and left the boat, left him ran back down to where our trucks were parked, got my truck, came back to where he was, backed my truck uh, to the uh, edge of the water and uh, let the tailgate down. Um, and ended up putting him in the back of my Suburban And I pushed the boat back out into the water to make it look like, you know, his boat was out there and he had drowned or disappeared or what, you know, I didn't give a lot of thought as to what was going to happen after that. I was just panicked as to getting out of that area and covering this up. So, um, I realized it was probably getting too late at this point to meet up with my father-in-law, but I was still gonna try and I sped okay, let me stop you for a moment you said that you were able to load, you loaded him into your suburban yes sir how big was Mike he was a little bit bigger than me um, he was a little heavier than me we were pretty close in size but he was a little bit bigger than me how much do you weigh um, back then probably 170 170 something like that how were you able to get a man that's 175 pounds dead weight into the back of your suburban by yourself? Um, it was not easy and it was not pretty. Um, but I had to make it happen. I mean, I had no choice. Um, and I can't even explain like how your body feels in that kind of a situation. I don't, I don't, unless somebody's been to war or something, I don't, I don't even know how to explain, but like you have so much adrenaline pumping through your body. You're just, it's just crazy. But, um, you know, it wasn't pretty and, and I never, I made a purposeful decision to never view him, to look at, look at him. Um, but, uh, I backed the truck down and there was an angle to 
the ramp. So it, the back of my truck was angled down toward the water, and I backed it all the way down to the edge of the water. So it wasn't there was no distance involved. Um, but yes, he was very heavy, and it was not easy to do that. But I had no choice. So you were concerned about meeting up with your father-in-law at that point. What happened next? Um, I sped back toward Tallahassee. Um, and I, as I was driving there, I was realizing I'm not going to make it in time. I didn't want to call him because I didn't want to turn my phone on. I didn't want there to be any record of where my phone was at. Um, so I left my phone off. Uh, and by the time I got back to Tallahassee, you know, I looked through the parking lot. We were going to meet at Carriage Gate parking lot. I looked through the parking lot, didn't see his vehicle there. And I decided the best thing for me to do was to go back to my house and pretend that I had overslept. Um, and then I could also make a phone call from my house to uh, my father-in-law, which would kind of prove that I overslept and I was at, at my house. Um, and uh, I wanted there to be a record of that. And all this is with Mike in the back of your Yes, sir. I actually, when when I was driving on Thomasville Road, I, I actually came up to a stoplight and there was a state trooper across from me. And I can remember just being freaked out about it. Um, but, I, I mean, I didn't have any choice. So that, and that's what I decided to do. So I drove home. Uh, pulled up into my driveway um, and was really, really hoping that Kathy was still asleep. Um, I went into the house as quietly as I could. She was still asleep. Um, I crawled back into the bed uh, and uh, had a phone there on the floor. I can remember dialing my father-in-law and telling him apologizing I'm so sorry I overslept um, and uh, I didn't want to wake Kathy up obviously because I had what was in the driveway but I wanted her to know I was there so I I, 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 I can't remember what I said to her but I think I halfway woke her up and said I'm going to go out with the dogs or train dogs. I, I trained dogs at the time and was gone for hours at a time uh, from the house doing stuff like that. But I, I don't remember exactly what I told her but I basically I wanted her to I, I wanted her to know that I was there to confirm that I was there but not wake up and start asking me any questions about what happened, why would you ever sleep, you know, anything like that. Um, so I did that. And then uh, I went back out to the driveway to leave. When I went out to the driveway, my driveway was angled, and I was walking behind my truck, and I saw out of the back tailgate blood was coming out of the back of my tailgate and dripping onto the driveway. And that freaked me out. So I rinsed that off and uh, was trying to figure out. I'd been thinking on the way from Lake Seminole back to Tallahassee, what, what was I going to do with him? And I don't know when I decided, but you know, ultimately I decided it had to be close and it had to be quick. Um, and it had to be, obviously, a location that you know, he wouldn't be found. Um, and I decided uh, on... Uh, an isolated uh, dirt road boat ramp uh, down at uh, Car Lake, but I had uh, no tools. And at that point, Car Lake was very low. Um, parts of it were dry, and like the other lakes, there were areas in the lake that that had puddles of water or mud. And my thinking was. If I got him there, I could take him out to one of those water holes or mud holes and put him in one of those, and, and that would be a safe place that he wouldn't be found. Um, but uh, but I had no, I had nothing to to do this with, so I had to go to a store. 
and I'm 90% sure the store that I ended up at was Walmart. Um, and I bought a shovel, I bought a tarp, and I bought weights, like um, weights that you lift weights with, because I was thinking that I would use the weights to weigh his body down in the water or a mud hole or whatever. Um, while I was in that store, I actually ran into a friend of ours, uh, Mike Phillips, and uh, I actually totally forgot about running into him or having any conversation with him until I ran into him later during the search for Mike Williams at the lake. And he said, "Yeah, I remember seeing you that day. You were you were in a panic. You were in, you were in a hurry." And he was thinking I was in a hurry to go search for Mike, um, but I was actually in a hurry because I was trying to bury Mike. Um, but uh, anyways, I bought those things at the Walmart and drove to Car Lake down to the end of the road turned my truck around backwards, um, back down to the landing. And, you know, my thinking was I was going to drag him way out into the lake. Um, and so I got the tarp and, and put it on the ground behind my truck, pulled Mike out, put him on that tarp, kind of wrapped him up. And as I pulled him instantly, I knew there was no way I was going to be able to move him any distance at all. Um, that it, he was just too heavy and that wasn't going to happen. So I had to find somewhere close and um, it was a really grown up area. And like I said, the lake was almost dry, so the water was down and I, I decided to, to put him down uh, in the in the lake bed itself, kind of on the edge of the lake, um, so that eventually when the water came back up, that area would be underwater. Um, and it was hidden from the road somewhat. Um, and uh, so I pulled him down to that area um, and started digging a hole. Um, and uh, it was it was hard. Um, I was uh, I was exhausted. I was getting bitten by ants all over me. I remember being scared that I was going to have to explain why I had ant bites all over me because there was ants where I was digging. Um, but um, actually, while I was doing this, I heard a vehicle coming down the road. And uh, so I kind of, I had, there were bushes there anyway, but I kind of made sure everything was flat and you couldn't see it from the road. And I ran back up to my truck and a, a guy drove up. He was coming down there to, to go hunting uh, out on the lake itself. And he and I made small talk, chit chat. I was obviously very paranoid and, and I got the impression, I can't remember why now, but uh, at the time, I got the impression that he might have been like a, a law enforcement type guy, maybe like a game warden or something like that. Um, but he talked about he was going deer hunting uh, out on the, uh, the lake bed. And so I kind of hung out at my truck and waited for him to get several hundred yards away uh, before I went back to uh, digging. Um, so eventually I got a hole big enough. Um, and I put him there and, uh, covered him up and, uh, made sure it, you know, didn't look suspicious as, as well as I could. But now I still had a problem because my truck had blood all in the back of it. And it was getting later and later in the day. And I knew at some point people were going to start calling me. Um, there was a 
family Christmas with my wife's family up in Cairo that we were supposed to be going to that afternoon or that night. Um, you know, I was just running out of time. And uh, so I uh, put the truck, put the uh, shovel in the back of the truck, and I knew I had to clean my truck up. And I think at that point, I can't remember the order. I can't remember. I went two different places. I went two different places to clean up my truck. One of them was I went to my parents' house and parked. They have a big lot, and I parked toward the back of it and uh, tried to use a hose to clean out the truck. And um, it, it, I think I went there first because it was closer to where I was, but it wasn't working very well. Um, and I realized I needed to have like a pressure washer. Um, and so I left there and drove around trying to find a car wash that had a pressure washer. And there were none on my side of town. So I ended up at Tharp Street in Old Bainbridge. There was a car wash there that had pressure washers. And uh, I cleaned out the back as best as I could there. And um, after that... Let's stop for a second. Yes, sir. Very much car lake. At some point, do you, for lack of a better term, go about your business, go to Cairo, meet Kathy and everybody in the family? Right. After I, after I cleaned up, I'm sorry. Thanks. Did you go up to Cairo and meet Kathy and the family? Yes. Okay. At some point, were you contacted about Mike being gone, missing? Right. Um, Who contacted you? My recollection is that my dad called me and said, my Mike's missing. Whenever that happened, what'd you do? Um, and wait, let me back up. When was that? I remember it being on the drive home from being up at Cairo for the Christmas party. So was this the same Saturday? Yes, sir. Okay, in the evening hours? Yes, sir. Okay. What'd you do? Um... You know, when my dad called, I, I kind of said, well, that's Mike, because Mike was known to be late and kind of irresponsible at times, going out on hunting or fishing trips or whatever. Um, but, um, you know, I said, I'll, I'll get back there and, and we'll, you know, go, go look for him. And uh, so got back to town, met up with my dad, and... Uh, Went with him over to Lake Seminole. That night or next day? That immediately when I got back to town. Okay. Um, there were a few people over there with boats, uh, mainly friends uh, and family. And um, those of us with boats started going out where his truck was. No, we didn't put in where his truck was. We put it in. There was a concrete landing before that. Um, which was a nicer landing um, that you weren't going to get stuck at. And uh, we, um, we, my dad and I went out on the lake and searched for Mike. He was searching and I was just lying. My understanding, the weather front came through and it rained during that evening. There was a storm that came through that night. Um, I think we got off the lake before uh, that happened, but, um, you know, my dad wanted to look at it. I think we were the last ones on the lake, and my dad didn't want to give up. My dad loved Mike.
later that evening when you were searching for the weather came in. Um, did you find anything that evening? Yes, sir. Um, I didn't really, I mean, I, I knew where Mike's boat was, and I didn't really want to be the one that found it. I would rather somebody else have found it, but my dad was just real determined, and, um, you know, he... Um, he took us to a spot. I knew it was going to be there, but he took us to a spot, and sure enough, there was Mike's boat. So we found his boat. Um, and um, I think we just left it. We didn't touch it. We left it where it was and went back in and told the whoever the law enforcement people were there at the time. But shortly thereafter, a pretty bad storm rainstorm and I think cold front came through that night. And did you go back to the lake the next day? Mm. I'm sure, I'm sure I did. I, the, the next two months were kind of a blur for me, but yes, I, I spent lots of time at the lake during the search um, because I kind of wanted to monitor what was going on. I wanted to put up a good, you know, front to look like I was out there looking like everybody else. Um, but uh, I, was, I was out there a lot. At some point, a um, hat was found on the lake. Is that not? A hat? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, were you the one that found that hat? I was not the one that found it. Um, I was the one that put it in the water. Um, during one of my searches on the lake, I was, well, Denise and I were getting concerned that nothing else was being found out there. Um, and I, I was hoping that his waders and jacket and all would be found to kind of confirm that, that he had drowned there. Um, and I wanted to keep the searchers in that particular area. So uh, I took a hat that was similar to a hat that, that Mike used, which was real distinctive. It had a weird-looking bill on it and stuff. And when I was out there uh, with another friend of mine, um, I threw it in the water in that area because I wanted to keep the people in that area because I wanted the waders and the jacket to be found to confirm that that's where Mike was and where he went into the water. What was that hat eventually found? It was. And you were asked to identify it? Yes, sir. You told law enforcement it was my favorite. Yes, sir. You brought up a point about you and Denise had concerns. All right, we're talking at that point. Mm hmm Following Mike's murder on the 16th, what communication did you have with Denise? I can't remember the first time that we talked. Um, we had prearranged that obviously our communication needed to be minimal, um, both by phone and, and in person. Obviously, we weren't going to be meeting up in parking lots and having sex and 
doing all that was normal for us to be doing. So we had decided that um, it's just too close to me. Can you push back a little bit? It's a little loud now. It feels like I'm at a concert. But um, so we had, we had decided uh, ahead of time that we really needed to minimize our contact. Um, I got a lot of information about Denise and what was going on with Denise through Kathy, who was going over to her house and, and seeing her and talking to her. Denise kind of sequestered herself up in her bedroom and uh, didn't want to be around a lot of people uh, during that time, which was smart of her to do. Um, and, uh, and so I got a lot of information from Kathy, but eventually, you know, she and I talked. Um, and there never was a conversation that was like, well, did it all go according to plan or, you know, we, first of all, I didn't want to talk about that because that was not the plan. What happened with Mike was not the plan that Denise and I had come up with. Um, and I stopped right there. I want to make it clear. The plan didn't play out the way you wanted to, but it certainly wasn't the plan that you and Denise had discussed to actually have him. The plan was for his death to occur, but it was not for it to occur in the way that it did. I mean, the plan was for him to fall in the water and for him to have a chance to survive it. Um, but obviously that's not what happened, and I didn't want to tell Denise that. Um, so we never had a conversation that was like, uh, did it all go according to plan? But it was quite obvious from the circumstances that Mike was gone and... You know, she assumed that what we talked about, the plan that we had made, she assumed that that was what had happened. It wasn't until years later that I tried to and somewhat told her that that's not what ended up happening. Right. So at some point you and her started talking again despite the distances. When was that? Um, the, the first time... Oh... I'd be guessing. I mean, I, I would say a few days uh, before we talked. I'm sure the first time we talked was just on the phone. It was it was a little while before I saw her in person because I remember being kind of nervous, um, and and uh, I just knew it would be weird to see her because of what we had done. Um, I just knew it would be weird to see her after that, kind of to face each other after that. But um, but you know, as the search went on and you know, long term, as things got back to normal, we just kind of settled back into the same routines. But the next thing, obviously, that we had to deal with was the fact that his body wasn't being found. Um, and so the concern between she and I then became, um, well, if his body's not found, what's going to happen with the life insurance? Okay. Is the conversation you're having with her? Yes. Okay. And what is she saying? What is her concern? Well, that if his body's not found, you know, what's going to happen? Is she going to get the money or not? Um, Did you and or her take any steps to facilitate that? <clears throat> to facilitate her getting the money? Yeah. I was not in a hurry to push that issue. I felt like we needed to kind of lay low on that and not appear to be, you know, the eager widow ready to cash in on her life insurance. Also, she was getting, uh, at that time, um, insurance companies were paying a ridiculous amount. I think 8% they were required to pay on death uh, benefit proceeds. So she was earning 8% as long as the money sat there, which you couldn't get that outside uh, in a bank or anything like that. So I knew the longer it drug out, the better it was going to be. We talked about that. Um, <laughs> Again, it was actually again it was actually my dad because he was concerned about Denise and he wanted her to get her money so she could pay her bills and uh, you know he he pushed he pushed it through um, the hoops that that uh, needed to happen for her to to end up getting the money quickly as she could but. What we came to learn, what he came to learn, what we all came to learn was she was going to have to get a death certificate issued by a judge through a court. Um, so probably my dad or me uh, hooked her up with an attorney, uh, Kurt Hunter, and uh, she talked with Kurt about what needed to be done. Um, 
And I think basically she had to file a petition uh, with the court stating everything that happened, talking about what a wonderful marriage she had with Mike. There was no reason for him to run off on her. Um, I can't remember what all had to go in the petition, but we talked about that um, ahead of time. And um, she ended up filing a petition, and it, it was granted, and she was issued a death certificate, so she was able to get the money. About what had happened specifically with Mike? Yes. No. Okay. At some point, law enforcement takes other looks at the cases and interviews people. Um, did y'all have any conversations about that? Well, this was years later, and a lot transpired in between Mike's death and law enforcement getting involved. I think it was three years later, maybe. Um, but, um, the first, the first thing that happened with me was I just got a call, uh, from a deputy. I don't remember if it was a Jackson County Sheriff officer or a, uh, investigator with FDLE, but I got a call from somebody and they wanted to talk to me about Mike Williams and the case. And, um, I agreed and, uh, went into FDLE, uh, on Riggins Road there and interviewed, uh, with two, uh, gentleman there and it became quite clear to me during that interview um, that they were suspicious uh, of what happened and not only that they were suspicious of me and Denise um, and I think even after I left that interview uh, I called her immediately and was freaking out um, you know that, that this was going on and, uh, right there. So you've gone in, you've done this, you mentioned that there were things, a lot of things that happened prior to that. Um, and this is approximately 2003, 2004, something like that? Yes, sir. Right. So prior to that occurring, um, had you and Denise talked about a possibility of what you would do if law enforcement started investigating this? Yeah, I mean, we basically weren't going to say anything. We had the, the way that we, the word that we put on it was we had an agreement. Uh, that she would never say anything about me and I would never say anything about her because we knew or we felt like um, that as long as neither one of us talked that nobody would ever, you know, find out what happened. Um, so we, we called it our agreement, um, basically. And, um, and we were probably pretty arrogantly confident in that agreement. I guess. Did you and her take any steps to ensure the fact that wiretaps or um, having a conversation with her code words, code signals, things like that? We um, we didn't get that way until after law enforcement started looking into things. The other thing that that. Um, made us really paranoid was uh, Denise, at first Denise was allowing Cheryl, Mike's mom, uh, to see Ansley and taking Ansley, Mike and Denise's daughter Ansley, out to Cheryl, Grandma Cheryl's house. And um, on one of those trips out to uh, Cheryl's house, um, Denise found a notebook that Cheryl had and she had written uh, her suspicions about Denise and me and uh, what had happened with Mike and, and when Cheryl was in another room or something, Denise read that um, and came back and told me what she had read and, and really freaked out about it and um, at that point didn't want uh, uh, Cheryl to, didn't want any contact with Cheryl really. Um, but um, between that and, and law enforcement getting involved, uh, we became very paranoid about uh, being monitored. So we agreed and talked about we weren't going to talk about anything on the phones anymore. Um, we were worried about our cars being bugged, our houses being bugged. Um, we had hand signals that we would use if we 
needed to talk about something related to Mike or law enforcement. Um, um, one of them was a C for Cheryl, and then the other one was this, like jail bars. Um, so when we did that, we knew that one or the other of us had something to talk about, and we would usually go, there was a park next to, there is a park next to Denise's house. Um, along Mississippi Road, we would go out to that park and go way out in a field on a bench, and uh, we would leave our cars in the vehicle, wouldn't take them. We would leave our phones in the vehicle, uh, make sure we didn't have a phone on us. We were, we were very concerned that we were being watched or monitored by law enforcement. Now backing up again prior to the interview, um, you're still married in 2000 to Kathy. And you start your relations back with Denise. Um, at some point did your marriage with Kathy start falling apart? Yes, sir. Um, I mean, it had started it had started, you know, when Denise and I started our affair in 97, but uh, after, after Mike was gone, um, we actually, Kathy and I, spent even more time with Denise, um, the three of us doing a lot of things, just because Denise and I wanted to be together. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, things just got worse and worse. I mean, Kathy you know, told me later, you know, that after Mike was gone, it was like there was no reason for me and Denise to be apart from each other. She made comments like that, but um, I think she was suspicious of us, you know, all along. But I never admitted to Kathy that Denise and I were having an affair, obviously, and, um, and that was just kind of basically the next step in the plan, but it couldn't be right off because that would look bad, so... Uh, Kathy and I ended up staying together. Um, I think our divorce wasn't finalized until 2004, I believe. At some point, did you and Kathy separate prior to the divorce? Yes, sir. At some point, was there a situation where you backtracked, essentially, and started and made a pledge to try and get back with Kathy? Um, and not yes, sir. What was, there, what was that about? There was a lot that led up to that. Um, as as you said, we were separated. Um, so Kath, Kathy and I were separated. Uh, I had a house to myself. Um, there was the incident that you talked about. We talked about earlier with. Uh, Angela Stafford, where Denise walked in on Angela and I in my bedroom. Um, after that happened, Denise was furious, um, and she, you know, we had a briefcase full of mementos, cards, notes, letters, pictures, videos, all sorts of things. She left my house and went to her house and burned it all. Um, she was very angry with me. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but she actually was having sex with a guy that she worked with um, uh, at work. And I think when she caught me with, the, I'm sorry, yes, sir. Um, and so when she caught me with Angela, uh, I think she decided at that point, well, I'm going to drop Brian and pursue a relationship with Mr. Bunker. Um, and so things just basically like went to hell with me and Denise. Um, and long story short, I mean, I just realized what a disaster my life was at that point. And Denise and I had, well, we hadn't broken up. She had basically dumped me for Chuck. And I found myself at church one day on July 4th. Um, heard a sermon about freedom. Um, you know, I felt like I was a slave to all that I had been living for, you know, in my relationship with Denise. And I had a, um, I guess you would call it a spiritual awakening or conversion, however you want to term it. Um, 
eventually the relationship with Denise and Mr. Bunker went haywire and south. Um, they had their legal issues with each other. Um, well, let's stop there real quick because you're on Mr. Bunker. Was there an incident between you and Mr. Bunker? That happened prior to me going to church that day, but yes, sir. Uh, the way that I found out about Denise and Chuck uh, was uh, she <clears throat> left town with him, uh, went up to Atlanta on a trip trip together, um, and I found out from one of her sisters that they were in Atlanta, and I was not happy. I was angry, um, and I wanted to confront her, you know, because we had been through a lot done a lot for each other. I mean, uh, I gave up half of my son's life to be with her. Um, you know, killed her husband. Uh, uh, and we'd done a lot to be together. And then for her to turn around and uh, go, uh, you know, sleep with Chuck didn't make me happy. So I, uh, I found out they were in Buckhead in Atlanta and I drove up there to confront them, confront her. Um, I didn't really care about him so much, but um, I ended up finding, uh, I ended up sitting in a lobby in a hotel and they came strolling by uh, together. And, um, you know, I confronted them and we ended up going outside and having a long argument, uh, conversation uh, out next to the street. Uh, in Buckhead she I wanted Chuck gone I didn't want to deal with Chuck uh, so my main focus was you need to get rid of Chuck um, she uh, got rid of him got him to leave us alone and uh, she and I uh, spent the night together in the hotel um, and I didn't know it at the time, but she was just kind of placating me when Chuck was, I think, got a room down the hallway in the hotel, uh, didn't really leave. Um, but uh, so we had that incident. Um, and uh, Denise told me later that uh, the way that she got rid of Chuck was uh, she told him that uh, if he didn't leave, that uh, I could have her turned in for insurance fraud, which I thought was just, it, it blew my mind that she told him that. I, I couldn't believe that she admitted that to another party. Um, Did you hear her say that, or is that just what she told you? And she told me this later, and we argued about it later. Um, so... The incident with Chuck happened, and I drove back to Tallahassee, and, and I was just done. I was just spent, and that's what kind of led me to kind of, I guess, <laughs> what I thought at the time was rock bottom. I didn't know I had so many rock bottoms ahead of me, but um, at that point, I ended up in church and, and uh, kind of had a spiritual reawakening, and over the next few months, I decided that uh, I, I wanted to try to reconcile with Kathy. Um, I still loved Denise. I still wanted to be with Denise. Um, eventually, Denise and Chuck's relationship imploded, um, and they had their, you know, legal issues and whatnot. And uh, so they broke up. My dad actually helped Denise uh, through all of that. Um, so they break up. You try to get back with Kathy. They broke up, and and Denise and I. Denise kind of had her own spiritual awakening, and this sound. I know this sounds all screwy, but um, we wanted to be together still, but we both agreed that the right thing for me to do was to try to get with Kathy. And if Kathy decided that wasn't going to happen, then we were free to be together. Um, Is that what you did? And so, yes, I tried to reconcile with Kathy. Um, did that work out? <laughs> it, it, not well. Um, 
Eventually, you and Kathy end up in a divorce. Yes, sir. We ended up getting divorced. Um, and so we're free to be together. When, Mike's. Was, the, when was the divorce with Kathy? <sighs> I, I'm, this is terrible, but I, but I don't remember when it was finalized because we had a long separation. I don't remember when the divorce itself was finalized. At some point, did you and Denise start becoming public with your dating? Yes, sir. Um, after the divorce was finalized and we decided enough time had passed from Mike's death, um, we, uh, we decided it was okay for us to gradually uh, start dating and... Uh, you know, we talked about it with a lot of people. There were some people that took it well. Uh, there were some people, uh, like her family and her dad, who took it horribly. Um, but um, we did start dating. Um, Eventually you got married. And then we got married uh, in 2005. Um, we were still concerned about the law enforcement side of it, but as time passed and nothing happened, we became less and less concerned about it. Um, you say that you were still concerned. Did you all have communications to, between each other on um, but what would you do if law enforcement ever interviewed? Right. Um, the, you know, things would come up in the media. We would see things online or in the news. Uh, Cheryl, uh, you know, never gave up. And um, kept pushing things. And um, so from time to time, that issue would be raised. Um, and I always wanted to talk about things a lot more than Denise. Denise did not like to talk about anything uh, related to that, usually. Um, but we, you know, we would typically not talk in the house. We would typically talk, you know, out at Lake Ella or a public place or wherever where we felt like we weren't being monitored uh, even at that point. Um, and did y'all have an agreement to pack the agreement not to talk to law enforcement? Yes, I mean, we promised each other uh, that neither one of us would ever say anything. <laughs> because we knew the only way that, that we felt like the only way they would get anything would be if one of us talked. And, I mean, I, I, I was concerned about Denise, if she ever got under that pressure, whether she would hold up to it or not. Um, you know, Kathy actually warned me, uh, I think the first time I heard uh, uh, Kathy talk about it, uh, she said, you know, you Kathy was trying to get me to talk, but uh, basically she said, you know you can't trust Denise and she'll throw you under the bus the first chance she gets. Would it be fair to say that you made assurances to her that being Denise, that you had not told anybody else about this particular case? Yes, sir. And did she make assurances to you that she had not told anybody? Else? The only person I knew of was, was Mr. Bunker, but, you know, she didn't say that Mike was murdered or anything like that. She just supposedly... Sure. Her, right. Now, 2016, you were, uh, there was the kidnapping arrest. Yes, sir. And following that, <clears throat> you confessed to the murder of the light, correct? Yes, sir. You read, led law enforcement to his remains. Yes, sir. The conversations with Denise leading up to the murder, did they occur in Leon County for the most part? Yes, sir. The conversations with Denise following the murder where the agreement was never to talk to law enforcement. Did that occur in Leon County, Florida? Yes, sir. Whenever she set up her alibi to stay at home and make phone calls, did that occur in Leon County, Florida? Yes, sir. Talked a lot about Denise Winchester, or Williams, formerly Winchester. Do you see her in the courtroom today? Yes, sir. Can you please point to her and indicate an article of clothing? An article of clothing? The pink sweater?
we had talked with the, uh, I had talked with the attorneys earlier and decided that it was too late to start into the cross-examination by the defense. It's not fair to make them go a little while and then break up their cross-examination. So I hope it doesn't break your heart, but we're going to break for the evening. Um, it's pretty reasonable time. Um, just leave your notes where they are. Um, don't discuss the case with anyone. Don't let anyone discuss the case with you. Let's stay off the internet and the social media. Don't review any media accounts of what's going on here. Let's be back tomorrow at 845. Um, and so we can get started promptly with this. Um, parking arrangement will be the same, so they'll bring you up the back way. Now, if somebody ended up over here, I'm not, I don't know exactly who, don't, don't go to the front of the courtroom, come to the back so we can get you in the jury room. Don't need to be hanging out over here with the witnesses and, and so forth. Um, make sure before they leave, everybody's clear on where they're coming and uh, what the plan is. Anybody confused or have a issue about uh, if not we'll let you step out of the bailiff we'll see y'all tomorrow morning 8 45 just leave your notes where they are uh, any issues from either side I thought that was that applied only if it was a third degree felony. Oh, not, that could, you know, that could be. I'll, I'll my my recollection of looking at it, and I did consider that issue, but I think that I think in the jury instructions they specified that this only applies if it's not a third degree felony. Um, well, if that's the case, you're right. If you look at 777.03, the accessory after the fact, 1A um, goes to, you know, what you're talking about, uh, wife or other family member, uh, and such crime was a third degree felony. Um, I, I think you need to look at it and be okay. certain of it, but I, but I think that's the provision that would come into play. But, and if, if you think an instruction is appropriate, draft something for me. But Thanks, anything else? Um, so how are we doing time-wise, Mr. Fuchs? Uh, a little bit behind schedule, but not much, and we may go for probably more. I think we'll be all right. We're still in the two-and-a-half, three-day range, so we are even with the door. Yeah. Okay. Mr. White? Um, I anticipate having all my uh, contacts, my witnesses, and even the ones traveling while we're here Thursday morning. We would not anticipate being in the defense case tomorrow based on Right, right. Certainly not tomorrow. Maybe. I mean, it would look like uh, sometime Thursday, so probably, right? Yes, sir. If I get my dates right. So now you get the trials and the days escape you, but uh, yeah. So sometime Thursday, I would think we'd be into the defense case. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's what I anticipate, Mark. Okay. All right. Anything else? If not, we'll see y'all 8.30 tomorrow morning. Yes, sir.
who's we've got the evidence worked out tonight. Of course, there's not much of it. I think you could. Find this. You're just going to stick the. What are you going to do with the evidence? Not much. Not much to it. 